Good morning, and thank you very much, Minister, for inviting me to this very important conference in your beautiful Basque country. My topic today is to introduce to you this concept, which we called Industry 4.0. Actually, I coined the term uh, for our um, government. It was a, a task which uh, Angela Merkel gave us to introduce the next wave in production based on the Internet of Things and Services. This graphic shows that in ICT technology we are no longer in the world of you know, the central computer, but we also are not longer in the world of the personal computer. Many of you may have it, but now we are in the post-PC era. That means we are surrounded by many compute devices. Actually, we call them embedded computers. And this is something which, especially in Europe, is extremely important. We have embedded computers in our premium cars, of course, in the trains, in aerospace, but more and more, and this is the topic today, we embed these systems with Internet connectivity into our machining tools in the factory, and this intelligent environment is one of the ideas behind the smart factory. So what is a smart factory? Very simple, it's a network of intelligent objects. The minister already mentioned machine-to-machine -machine communication between these objects in the factory, but it's very important that not only the machining tools, the production tools in the factory are networked, but even the emerging product, the product, the physical product which is to be sold and produced, this is communicating with the machine, and this is actually one of the key ideas that the product which is emerging Let's suppose a car which is to be constructed as a unique object which is individualized. This car, emerging car, talks to the machine and requests services from the machine. It wants to be painted, it wants to be um, uh, assembled and so on. This information is contained with the emerging product in machine-to-machine -machine communication. Of course, we, knew, uh, we need cloud technology. A lot of data has to be stored. We have context-sensitive and location-based smart services in the factory, and we cross-link assets and products in the factory. So there is a lot of communication, thousands of small Internet nodes in such a factory of the future. As you did it here in Basque Country, we had a national roadmap. We started with embedded systems. A typical embedded system produced in Germany is the airbag. The first airbag was introduced by um, Bosch, and it's a cyber-physical system. It uh, has embedded a small computing device, but it's also a physical device, as you know, when it explodes and saves your life. Then we went on to so-called networked embedded systems. There are many cars which has pre-crash automatics or intelligent street crossings are examples. And now the next wave in our national roadmap is indeed a cyber physical system. Cyber means the world of the Internet. Physical is the physical world which we have in production. And now we combine both together. Other cyber-physical system applications are, for instance, in energy, the so-called smart grid. If we have smart factories, smart grid, smart uh, intelligent transportation systems, we will have the digital city, the smart city, and smart space of the future. This is idea. When we started the project, um, then our government, especially the Ministry of Economy and the Minister of Technology and Education, gave about 500 million euro of subsidies for research and development, both to industry, small and medium enterprises, and also to um, universities and research institutes. It's an evolution 
from embedded systems to cyber physical systems. Very important in Industry 4.0 are, of course, the ICT components, especially software. Of course, even today, there is no machine in, uh, in manufacturing which has no software. Most of the machines already have a little bit of software in it, but this will be now turned around. In the future, it's software plus a machine. So the software plays a much more important role than before. ICT is actually seen as the innovation motor number one in advanced manufacturing. Now, as it was already said, the first industrial revolution was based on using water and steam for mechanical processes. The second one was based on the new upcoming electro energy used for motors. So mass production became possible, but very uniform. These Ford cars were produced only in one color. Then the third industrial revolution, which is still ongoing in some parts of the world, introduced heavy-duty robots, robots which were in caves, which were very dangerous and did things uh, which were done with a lot of physical force. So actually they substituted very tough physical work, like heavy assembly or painting a car. Now in the fourth industrial revolution, we use, as I said, cyber physical production systems. And we will see what this means. In Germany, like in the Basque country, industrial productivity is still the backbone of the economic performance. We have more than 14 million jobs are dependent on industrial production. And very important, the big surplus in trade of about 158 Euro, billion euro was created by industrial products, especially in machining tools, but also in automotive industry. So we thought we have to go on. We have to prepare for the next wave in industrial production so that we can stay competitive. And this means that we want to have, first of all, all IP factories. We want to have embedded digital product memories which tell the machines which production services are needed. We want to have green and urban production, zero emission, resource efficiency, and urban production so to reintroduce the manufacturing also in the small and big cities, not only in the rural area, because otherwise you have too much traffic for the workers, and they again produce a lot of CO2. And we use the idea of app stores on the cell phone or on the iPad for software-defined products in the smart factory. Now, what are the socio-economic drivers of Industry 4.0? First of all, we observe worldwide an increasing product variability. We also observe that the product life cycle becomes shorter and shorter. We also unfortunately have to face the volatility of the markets. The markets go up and down in various parts of the world and of course we have an enormous cost pressure. On the other hand, there is a big tendency for so-called mass customization batch size one, or if it's not so extreme like batch size one, at least low volume and high mixture factories are urgently needed. Another point I already mentioned is that our chancellor in particular is very keen to have resource efficiency, clean and urban production. And then we have the societal problem of an aging society, at least in Germany, but I think the same holds all over Europe. This means we need later retirement. 
And later retirement means that we have to prepare the workplaces that in the long run people who are older than 65 years still can work and enjoy work in such a factory. And this means that we also have to change, of course, the working place. And another big problem in Europe is, of course, and I think the minister told us already, we need skilled workforce. We have a certain lack of people who have both skills in mechanical engineering, in electronics, in manufacturing, plus in IT. And so we need also to change and adapt our curricula, not only at the universities, but also at polytechnical schools and in the schools. So today I want first to explain you uh, how this path from cyber physical systems and smart factories working, the role of such digital product memories for mass customization, semantic web services in decentralized cyber physical production, the importance of skilled workers in so-called industrial assistance systems, and finally, the role of new standards and norms for Industry 4.0. Let me start with a small movie. Today, machines, factories, and ideas are first simulated before being implemented. Machine productivity depends on the performance of the program. In the future, machines can perhaps even identify the potential for optimization automatically, coordinate among themselves, and involve humans if needed. But that's not all. Machinery and plants have to be even more flexible in the future. Production is moving away from mass-produced goods. Increasingly important are highly individualized products that can nevertheless be produced efficiently. To enable a rapid adaptation to changing requirements, consistently defined interfaces are needed. Principles like plug and play can also be implemented in production and considerably reduce the effort involved in the conversion of a plant. The smart product knows everything about its individual configuration its customer and its destination. The soap bottles with white stoppers have different destinations than the soap bottles with black stoppers. In the future, components such as the Bosch diesel injector will be produced in small quantities and in real time. The production starts only after somewhere in the world a car maker has actually placed a concrete order. The order form not only contains all information about technical requirements, but also about destination and client. The information is embedded in the component and is capable of managing the production process, for example, by ordering missing components. This was a first look into the reality of uh, uh, Industry 4.0. Let me give a comprehensive example, a very simple example from food production. In Germany, we have a new small company. It started actually only with three people. Now they have more than 300 employees. And what do, do they produce? A very simple product, which you eat for breakfast, so-called muesli, you know, Swiss term, muesli cereals, where you put in nuts and all kinds of uh, interesting stuff to uh, generate a nice taste. Actually, this company has 80 different ingredients which you can configure yourself in the Internet. So you go to your Internet on the smartphone and order a muesli which is customized. Now, there are four, four, uh, 566 billion variants because this system works um, on the matter of cramps. You can say, I want to have five cramps of hazelnut and I want to have ten uh, cramps of, you know, kind of dried banana pieces in my muesli. And this is automatically done. Now, the interesting thing is not the product, but how it is done. Namely, it uses the Industry 4.0 technology in the following sense. When it is started, it prints on the tube where you fill in this muesli in the factory, it prints the customer specification. How much of what do you want? And then this tube goes around the factory and goes to the machines which fill in the specific stuff. 
So you have 80 different machines, and you can see like a taxi, the product goes through the factory and asks, please give me five grams of hazelnut. So this is the idea. You see the production process is inverse because normally in a factory there's a central computer saying, this machine, please put this into this, um, in this uh, basket. But it wouldn't work because here we are in mass customization. Every single order is different. So you have to turn around the production process, and this is done directly from the Internet. It goes to the packaging, and from the package um, form, it goes to the different machines. So it's a complete revolution in thinking also to organize a factory. The same happens if you manufacture a kitchen, the largest uh, European kitchen manufacturer in, Germ in Europe. Every day, they uh, produce 2,600 kitchens, and the kitchen, of course, must fit individually to your room. So there are 14 million variants of kitchens which can be produced here. Or uh, uh, to give another example, we have now uh, the uh, generation of perfume, mass customization of perfume. Actually, 36 so, uh, 36,000 unique perfumes are generated per day, so the customer creates the own perfume. And you see here a look in the factory where uh, it's not only the s uh, smell and the odor which is uh, produced, but also the bottle is different, many different bottles, even the spray. The packaging, you see every bottle is a little bit different because, again, in the Internet, you order this individualized product, it's manufactured, and then 24 hours later, it's already ready to be shipped. This is another simple example for mass customization. Now, how does this work? Of course, we don't want to destroy the existing factories. This was a huge investment. In many cases, we can retrofit an existing uh, factory by introducing some small cyber physical uh, systems on top of the existing infrastructure in the factory. The heart is, for instance, in this case, a um, micro web server which runs on a very short, uh, small machine. The machine is only as large as a piece of sugar for breakfast. These small pieces of sugar are attached to the various machines, and you see the internet antenna, the uh, Wi-Fi antenna, is larger than the computer itself. So all these small computers, you know, communicate by machine-to-machine -machine communication. They are using a interoperability protocol, which is you, uh, called OPC UA. We use this a lot in Industry 4.0 for communication between the different machines. On top of these small cyber physical objects, we have many, many sensors. The factory of the future will have thousands of small sensors. So you have, as the minister already mentioned, a real-time control of all events in the factory. And these um, sensors are very inexpensive. We can produce such sensors now on the level of less than one euro. You plug them in, to the different cyber physical systems and you get information about, you know, distance, uh, of course, gas, potentiometer, gyro, uh, moisture, light, temperature, humidity, and so on, what have you. It's uh, a big uh, set of sensors which are really very cost efficient. And then there is another very important component, which is the so-called product memory. So every object in the factory has a data shadow. We can say a kind of digital twin. This is the product memory. It, from the birth of an emerging product up to recycling it at the end, when we don't want to uh, no longer use it, this memory keeps a track record, kind of a diary of the product. So the whole life lock is in digital form, comes with the product. It's a physical hardware chip which is on the product itself. And this is used both for manufacturing, but later also for maintenance and additional services, even for the end consumer. 
There are many uh, such systems, cyber physical uh, components, which you can superimpose to existing uh, factory. As I said, DigiConnect, this is what we use right now. We also have systems based on the so-called Raspberry Pi or Gadgeteer from Microsoft. Many different options, of course, are available. It's very important that this product now ha it can be used as an information container. The product itself carries information across the complete supply chain and its entire life cycle. The product is also an agent. The product can now, because it has internet connectivity, actually complain to the environment. It's too hot here, it's too cold, or whatever. The humidity is too, too high. And the product is also an observer because the product has some cheap sensors, so it monitors itself and its environment. So, for instance, this um, small package of pills says, I'm already two minutes open, please close now, and so on. This is transmitted, a message over the Internet is possible. Let me give you a very concrete example how this is done. We have here a simple key uh, Finder. We did this uh, as a demonstration for our chancellor last year. We said, you know, you have a smartphone and you have such a, a key holder where you put your house keys and so on. And if you lose your keys, the smartphone will complain. It's a very simple um, electronics because they use a Bluetooth connection and uh, when the keys are too far away from your smartphone, the smartphone starts complaining. Very simple idea. Now, how can we produce something like that? Of course, it's a piece of plastic where you can put your keys, but it's also electronics, so it's an assembly task. There's a semantic product memory chip right in the plastic frame of the product. You see it here, the red uh, arrow shows, this is the electronics which says, this is the recipe, how I want to be produced. And then the uh, Bluetooth circuit should be uh, put in. Also a personalized keychain finder may have a metal shielding with laser engravature, and we actually put the name of Angela Merkel on this automatically. So what happens? In our factory, first the system reads what is in the product specification and then it goes around the factory and looks for services like in a marketplace. What machines are the appropriate machines to produce this specific smart product? And um, the idea is that we not only exchange bits and bytes, but we also uh, have a semantic description. Because communication means that really the machines have to understand each other. They use an ontology and a language which they share so that each uh, machine can give the other machine some information and really understands it automatically. This is very important. So we have such a semantic factory description in ontology languages which are now widely used worldwide and which become standardized. Now, Let's look again in our keychain key finder. We have the semantic product memory. It says we have to select the top shell. Then we have to uh, select a circuit and package it into this frame. Then we want to engrave something, and then we put the, uh, the top and bottom shell together, assembly process. Now this piece goes through the factory and does some production path planning based on the semantic product memory. There is an intelligent carrier, this is like the taxi going through the factory, and there is uh, then the execution. So for instance, a CNC milling machine is called by the product and starts operating. So it's a very uh, communication uh, intensive process. One of the nice features of such a, a factory is that we can say to one specific piece, and we showed this when our chancellor came, we said she now wants very fast production. So then when we tell this to the product, it goes on a fast track. It actually replans such that the production is very efficient. But unfortunately, if we go to an extremely efficient fast production of a single piece, the CO2 gets higher because we have to use a little bit more energy. So we can also tell the product, please be produced in a way 
that it's a green product with a minimal CO2 footprint because with all our sensors we actually can track the CO2 footprint of every product in microseconds. So the process is different for uh, this specification. Now, if we assume that one machine fails, also we can plug in another machine, as was shown in the video, and immediately the production goes on. This is very important because we want to ha uh, be able to exchange or bring in new machine. Let's think back about our muesli example. If the company decides to also introduce a new ingredient for the muesli as an option, let's say we want to fill in also some dried cherry, cherries, then we simply put a new machine in the row of the 80 other machines and one minute later already the production is adapted to this. Why? Because this machine which we plug in brings its own description what it can do, what service it offers. And like in a marketplace, when you have a new booth selling tomatoes and people want on their list uh, tomato, they go to this booth. Very simple idea. And this is done also here with the so-called plug and produce uh, manufacturing philosophy. Now this sounds maybe a little bit theoretical, but we already have the first deployed industry 4.0 factory line. One is uh, in Saarland. Saarland is uh, even smaller than Basque. It's only half of the population, one million people, but very product, uh, uh, production oriented. And one of the big factories of Rexroth Bosch Group is there. And just a few uh, weeks ago, we have deployed the first complete factory line which produces hydraulic valves in large varieties, about 4,000 4, different valves in this smart factory. And what is interesting here is that it's not completely automatic. In this valve production, you still need uh, manual workplaces, but these are hybrids. Robots work together with humans uh, and uh, use this idea of the product memory. And we also have a so-called smart, connected, active cockpit where you actually can switch very easily from one product to the other in a few minutes. This is very important. We even can produce on the same line four different products at the same time. This is called multi-adaptive factory. And in this factory, we also use the so-called backpack system for the material supply. As soon as we switch to another production in the same factory, we just switch the backpack, bring in the material supply. We have smart material containers with RFID technology. And we have, of course, worker guidance system. Because, please remind, the new factory of the future demands a lot more process changes for the working people. So the job becomes much more interesting. You don't do the same task, you know, for a couple of weeks. No, every day you change because the products are changing, the processes are changing, and therefore we need, we cannot send the workers to courses, long courses, but the system itself guides the worker. And as I say, we can retrofit legacy factories by additional layer of these cyber physical systems. So it's not a huge investment to change. Now, as the minister already mentioned, I think it's very important in Europe to have human-centered assistance for the smart factory, because we say the people are still in focus in the factory. This will be not a factory which is only, you know, full of machines. People play a very prominent role also in the smart factory. And in fact, our chancellor said we have to have the workers' union right at the beginning. Actually, we had the president of the workers' union developing this concept together with us so that people don't protest when we start to introduce smart factories in Germany. This was a very good process, and today the working unions really say industry 4.0 is excellent. We want this and we support this. Why? Because, as I said, we have very advanced multimodal human-machine interaction. 
We have tutoring systems which are personalized in situ. The, the people are trained in the factory, not by a PowerPoint in a seminar room, but in their working environment. We use augmented reality, virtual reality, dual reality as assistance systems. And we have very good exoskeletons, that means robots, which reinforce the human physical force so that you don't get sick from working and can work longer. In addition, we have app stores for the smart factory, so that even here, it would be very interesting, you can have multilingual uh, interface. You can run the machine with a Basque interface, Spanish interface, English, German, even Turkish, if you have Turkish workers like in Germany. But also you can download an app to make your machine more efficient in energy consumption. Of course, these apps are more expensive, but it's a very good business for the machining tool companies to sell not only the machines but also software where you can tune and change the machines. Very important are also resource efficiency improvements. So we have now location-based um, systems where you can go along the factory and see where is the energy leakage and improve. On the other hand, as I said, we can use augmented reality to train the workers and give them feedback during the work. We use, for instance, Google Classes for the workers and they see additional information while working. So they get instruction how to do a maintenance process. Let me show a short video to demonstrate this. Classes recognize components and working steps of a facility. They advise humans what needs to be done next. Should a staff member forget a working step, the software recognizes it and reports the error. This way, risks can be reduced, even if staff are not sufficiently familiar with a piece of machinery and its repairs. In production, intelligence systems support humans in manual activities. The product has stored its data for a lifetime on an RFID chip and can pass on its own assembly instruction at any time. Thanks to clear and precise pictures, there aren't even any language barriers. Last point is that with Industry 4.0's robots are no longer locked in safety cells like the lion in the cave in the zoo, but they come out and work together with human workers. You can see outside such a KUKA robot, for instance, which is able to work perfectly with a human. Because we need the gender balance also in robots, we developed at DFK a, a female robot. We call it Fembot, Ayla. You see the female robot. It's also a anthropomorph robot where, which is lightweight, so you re really can interact. You can push it away. It can help you, but it cannot hurt you. This is a robot which has not only stereo compass, it also can read with its hand the information from a product because it has RFID reader in the hand. So the grasping point, the size, weight, all is determined by this female robot. It's very helpful in factories. And thus we can even have working uh, arrangements. Here I show a picture again from Bosch where we installed a system where normally five workers are working. Now if one worker is sick, yeah, we use one of the emergency robots to fill in his place. But when he comes back, he still has his working place. I think this is very good for the uh, unions also that we show the robots only can substitute if there is an overload or if a worker is ill or is on vacation, then we use this emergency robot so we can actually change. And this is a new generation of robots which can work in the environment which is suited for human workers. I think this was a very important idea. And as I said, we want the green production. We have now the first factories in Stuttgart opened, which are in the middle of a residential area. People live around the factory. There is no noise, no emission, no gas, no smell, nothing. It's absolutely clean. And I think this is a future because we want that the workers can go by foot or by bicycle to the factory. This is the new, so in the center or in a small village, 
and not outside because there was longer tendency to have to disband the factories from urban life. President Obama, when he visited Berlin uh, last year, we talked to him and he said, you know, the spike in unemployment in the uh, U.S. was actually uh, uh, due to a loss of manufacturing. Yeah? And of course, there are companies like Google, uh, often cited, or Apple, but they have a minimum of employees. Google altogether only 7,000 people. This does not, you know, is not relevant for the economy. It's a big stock market price, but unfortunately, we need more people employed, and this is good in manufacturing. So he follows, he has published a book through MIT called Making in US. Yeah? It was a task force by the president saying we need more. And he gave as an example uh, Germany because we uh, didn't destroy our own industry, uh, but we tried to find, like you do here in Basque, a boosting of the industrial sector by new technology, bringing ICT and um, production together, whereas the U.S. has a little bit failed with the economy by just only going into service and start-up companies. Of course, we need standardization, because when we want to dominate this from Europe, we need uh, the standards to be done here, not in the United States, not in China. So we have this whole uh, pyramid from Ethernet, IP, OPC, UR, and we have higher level protocols which have to be defined in W3C. We are working on this because, of course, there is a competition. Uh, United States also tries with their industrial internet consortium. China tries to dominate this. But I think in Germany and also here in Basque country, they have the privilege that we have both in, uh, production and ICT on a very high level. So there is a good chance. Let me just summarize by saying that from smart factories, we will go to smart products and smart services. And all this is based on smart data. So let me conclude by saying I would propose that there is a um, cooperation between Germany and Basque country in R&D. We have very nice uh, research institutions here, like I know, um, uh, for instance, uh, Vicomtech, but, but there may be others, DFKI. And of course, we need the same on the industrial side. In DFKI, we have more than 30 different companies in manufacturing which are on our board, so we can help to also have cooperation with the Basque industry. I think Bilbao was the center of Basque countries in this industrial revolution during the 19th century. And Industry 4.0 is a chance for the Basque country to become again a leader in the fourth industrial revolution. Industry 4.0 can boost both the production of next generation manufacturing tools and smart services based on digitally enhanced physical products. Industry 4.0 will create new jobs since mass customization needs the collaboration of skilled workforce and next generation lightweight robots. Thank you very much for your attention.